Well, you know, even tonight as we began worship, it was so wonderful as we sang those songs and thought about, you know, the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God who was slain. We can't really talk very much about forgiveness without really focusing on the Lamb, uh, Jesus, who gave his life so that forgiveness is even possible. And even as we uh, go through some of these notes um, on forgiveness and the fact that it really is a master key to everything that God offers us, um, we, we do need to focus on the picture of Jesus on the cross. I mean, just to get that sense of the kind of forgiveness that God has in his heart for us. And um, the precious blood that was spilt for us for us, each one of us that purchased us and, and bought us back from that lost place of the kingdom of darkness and has now transferred us into his family and into his kingdom of light. It's, it's such a powerful thing. I just love it when we also sing that song, Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You know, we need it every day. Every day we need it. And as we will study tonight, we also need to give it every day. We need to receive forgiveness, and we need to be those that forgive. And that we live our lives that way, so that we can be that holy temple that God inhabits. And we can have that sweet communion with God so that he can show his power through his children who he loves so much. Well, as we make our way through these notes, um, I, oh, I, I did find some, t some typos. So when we get there, <laughs> you'll see it. I kind of, in a hurry, did a little uh, copy and paste so that Debbie would make copies of these. And I normally wouldn't worry about typos, but one of them I think I call us the devil. And I, I don't mean to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just when we get there, scribble out the word we. Because <laughs> it's, it, it's not, it, that's not the picture I'm painting tonight. Oh, Lord, help us. We just thank you. Just speak to our hearts. We want to understand this. It's such a miracle, this forgiveness, this amazing quality of you that you then impart to us. Um, we just thank you for meeting with us and helping us. In Jesus' name. So forgiveness is the master key that God gives us to unlock everything that he has for us really need to think about that. It's the master key. And forgiveness originates with God. It's part of who he is, his love, his mercy, his justice, his goodness, his character. Every forgiveness is a part of him. Daniel 9, 9 says, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. And Daniel goes on in that prayer to cry out to God on behalf of Israel because they're in captivity because of their sin and he's asking for restoration and he knows the source of forgiveness is the Father. There would be no need for forgiveness if there were no sin. Sin is the reason forgiveness is even necessary. Just think about that for a minute. There really would be no need for forgiveness if there weren't sin. If we didn't sin against God, or if people didn't sin against us, or we didn't sin against people, there'd really be no need for forgiveness. But forgiveness is necessary because there is sin. And we've been born in sin, and we need deliverance from that. And the world in which we operate is filled with sin, um, and that would be anything that opposes the laws of God, the rule of God, the good plan of God is sin. Anything that is not in alignment with his goodness and with his plan. 
Forgiveness is a gift from God. It's a master key that opens the door in our lives to eternal life, reconciliation with God, and becoming a new creation in him. So it is the key that opens that door, his forgiveness and us receiving of that forgiveness. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This master key of forgiveness opens the door to all the blessings of God and the glory of his kingdom. The master key of forgiveness opens the door to healing also and provision, to protection, intimate friendship with God so that we can hear his voice and so we can see spiritually. All of this is dependent on God forgiving us and as we will see, us forgiving others. This master key of forgiveness is perhaps one of the most powerful weapons used by God and by us to destroy the works of the devil. This is something we really need to see, that forgiveness is a weapon. It's a, it's a weapon that is not carnal, but it is a weapon that God uses against the devil. The devil thought that he had ruined God's creation by getting man to sin. He thought that he had ruined the plan of God but God's weapon is this loving forgiveness that then he had this plan before the foundation of the world was ever laid that he himself would offer his son to be the provision so that we could be forgiven. It's a powerful weapon against hell. And I would say, and that's one of the things I'm going to emphasize in this class tonight, it's a weapon of our warfare as we live each day. That if we really want to see the works of the devil destroyed, we must partner with God in forgiveness. It destroys the, the works of the devil. Forgiveness removes the residue that sin leaves the scars, the, the ugliness that sin leaves. Forgiveness removes that, so it destroys the work of the devil. It says in 1 John 3, 8, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now the interesting thing is there are some divine requirements for this master key to work. You know, one of the things I think we mix up in the body of Christ is that because we know that God's love is unconditional, it really is. He loves everybody, doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. It doesn't matter if you hate him or if you don't even believe in him. He loves you. His love is unconditional. However, one of the things we need to understand is that all of the benefits and all of the good things that he wants to give to every single person, they actually do have some divine requirements attached to them. There is an action on our part that we have to take. And this isn't that we do enough good works so that we can impress God. These aren't actions that we have to kind of make up in our head to think, oh, what would he like? I'm going to do this, this, and this so I can earn it. It's not an earning. It's that God's laws function a certain way, and his kingdom is a kingdom of order. And he tells us in his word what those divine requirements are. And they are different from situation to situation, but it's in his word. For instance, we can't have salvation unless we choose to believe, unless we respond to the invitation and respond by faith, believing that Jesus is the Son of God 
and that he did die for our sins and the offer of forgiveness is ours. The divine requirement is that we must respond to the invitation of God and believe him and then base our faith on that. There are other divine requirements. He makes promises, but he does give conditions for those promises sometimes. In many cases, you will see where they're listed in scripture. So there are divine requirements for this master key to work. It will unlock all kinds of doors for us, wonderful doors in his kingdom, wonderful blessings. It'll unlock power. It'll unlock his life and purposes for us, but they're divine requirements. And that is that we have to agree with God and do it as he says. God has given us this key, but we have to open the door by using the key as God instructed us. We have to confess our sin. That's one we all know. But we have to acknowledge that we've sinned and, and confess it before God. And we know 1 John 1, 9 and 10 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then it goes on to say, if we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. Number two, another requirement is we have to rece receive the gift of forgiveness by faith. God has this master key and he wants to give it to us, but we have to receive it in order for it to work, obviously. He can offer it to us, but if we don't believe him and don't receive it, it's not going to work. Third, we must participate in this for forgiveness and let it change us as much as um, it's something that we receive from God. It's some something happens in us. And, and so we have to be changed by this gift of forgiveness. We have to forgive others. We have to become forgiving as God is forgiving. We don't get to choose to say, well, I'd like your forgiveness, God, but mm -mm, don't want to forgive other people. That's not part of the deal. This is a life-changing thing that changes our very nature. And we come into that place in God, and we agree with his heart, and we let him impart his love and his heart and his forgiveness in our hearts so that we forgive others and become those that pass on this wonderful gift of life and salvation and forgiveness. Forgiveness is not just a gift for us from God. It's a master key given to us so that we might use it daily and pass it on to others so that the works of Satan might be destroyed. Remember, the master key of forgiveness is a weapon of God to destroy the works of the devil. Every last bit of the, reven the residue of sin, Jesus wants destroyed. Every last bit of it. He wants the memory of it destroyed. He wants all of the feelings, the terrible feelings that sin brings up. He wants, in, of those actions of sin, he wants those destroyed. He wants the works of the devil destroyed, so there's no victory for Satan at all. Every bit of it. If we don't forget, if we don't forgive the work of the devil, that sin that was committed against us or that sin that we've committed and we're not forgiving ourselves, it still has power to destroy. We need to see that. The, the wages of sin is death. Sin destroys. And when we don't forgive and hold on to the sins of others, or even to our own sins, and remember them all, it'll bring destruction in us. It sin destroys. We want the power of the blood of Jesus to so wash over that, and the love of God to so invade that place that that sin doesn't have the power to hurt us anymore. We don't want Satan to have any power left with the works that he's done against us or against others. Forgiving others is a divine requirement for using this master key. 
So now I'm going to read a passage of scripture, very familiar, and I'm not going to make a whole bunch of commentary on it because you've all heard sermons about it, but we just, it's good to hear it. And it's from Matthew 18, and it's the parable of the unforgiving servant. Jesus tells this parable in the midst of conversation with his disciples about the kingdom. He's actually on the way to Jerusalem to be crucified. It's after the transfiguration, and he's in conversations with his disciples about the kingdom of God. And so Peter says to him, it says, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And then he begins his parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Not that I understand a lot about what a talent is, but from what I understand, this was like an, you, you couldn't even pay this back. This was a huge debt. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and that the payment, that the payment might be made. The servant, therefore, fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, and he released him, and he forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who, who owed, owed him a very little amount of money. He owed him a 100 denarii, and he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So the fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. But the unforgiving servant would not. But he went, and he threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved. And they came, and they told their master all that had been done. And then the master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all of that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had compassion on you? And his master was very angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. And then Jesus finishes the parable by saying, So... My heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you, from his heart, does not forgive his brother his trespasses. There are some other passages of scripture that tell us the same thing, that this is a divine requirement of forgiveness, is that we not only receive forgiveness from God, but we are to give forgiveness to others. Matthew 6, 12, which is a part of the Lord's Prayer. You know, we know the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Here on earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And then we come to it. And forgive us our trespasses, or forgive us our debts, as we forgive those who trespass against us or forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Notice the word as in that phrase. Forgive us our trespasses in the same way <laughs> that we forgive others' trespasses. And in case you might think I've taken that too far, let's go on to see the next couple verses. Jesus goes on to say, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's pretty serious. 
Luke 6, 35 through 38 says, but love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and the evil ones. <laughs> Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. And here it is. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. Because for with the same measure that you use, it'll be measured back to you. This is the principle of sowing and reaping. We reap what we sow. It's a principle, it's a law of God, it's a law of the universe, and God is telling us this is a part of receiving forgiveness and then giving forgiveness. It's a, it's a very important part to remember. Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, he will also reap. James 2.13 says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And then from the Beatitudes, we remember the verse that says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Wow, this is sobering. There are divine requirements in order to receive the benefits that God wants to give us. But we can't really do it without his grace. And we remember what Pastor David said to us about God's grace and how he defined it. It's God's power at work within us. So we don't have an excuse if we don't think we can forgive because the fact is we, we can't in our human strength, forgive like God forgives. We can't do it. But we have God dwelling within us, and he's promised that he will give us the power to forgive if we're willing, if we're willing. So it's an act of the will. It does take God's empowerment to be able to forgive, but he's made it possible if we're willing to believe him and obey. Now, I'm just going to read some passages. I'll start with one and then talk a little bit and then read another one. Um, from the book called um, Tramp for the Lord by Corey Ten Boom. I don't know. I think most of you probably know who Corey Ten Boom is, but in case you don't, I'll just give a little synopsis. She was a woman who was from Holland, and um, she and her family during World War II um, became part of the Dutch resistance against the Nazis. And when the Nazis occupied Holland, um, she and her family um, provided a hiding place for the Jews so that they could be protected and uh, until they could be sent to a safer place. And so as part of the Dutch resistance, a lot of people stayed in their house until they could kind of scurry them away and get them off into other countries where they were safe. Um, and then, I think it was about 1944, um, there was some, the, the Dutch resistance had been infiltrated, and so there was someone who knew that they were doing this, and they were turned in basically to the Gestapo, and they were arrested and put in prison um, in concentration camps. Some of her family members, I think the younger ones, were let go because they weren't as much involved in it, but Corey and her sister Betsy and her father were retained in the German prisons. Her dad was elderly, and he died about 10 days later in the prison, and then um, she and Betsy were in the prison together um, in Holland, they were moved from prisons to prison, and then eventually moved to Ravensbrück in Germany, one of the concentration camps. Um, but through this time, um, they shared the gospel in their prison cells. They suffered a lot. They saw horrors. They were partaking of horrors. I mean, it was just a terrible, terrible um, story about what people went through. You can read the book, The Hiding Place, and then her, her book, Tramp, 
um, for the Lord is a good one. She's written other books too. But um, anyway, then um, shortly before the war, um, her sister Betsy died in prison. Um, and then just a, not long after that, just a, I think it was only a few days or I don't know how long it was, um, Corey was called to roll call and expected to be sent to the gas chambers because they were killing everybody her age and older. And the people with her were, but for some strange reason, she was led to the gate, the gate opened, and she was set free. She learned later it was a clerical error. <laughs> we know it was God, but you know it was, it was a, a, a horrifying uh, testimony of, of things that they went through, and yet amazing victory that these um, people had in Jesus, even in the midst of their suffering. So um, I'm reading um, from her book, Tramp for the Lord. After she got out, she, after her recovery and everything from it, she opened up a home to help people who had been uh, victims of the Nazis who were suffering all the wounds of that to help them recover and forgive and to find Jesus. And, and then later she began to minister to the Germans themselves. And then eventually, as years went on, she went all over the world. She was an amazing woman. Um, I think she died on her 91st birthday, but she was active and involved in an amazing way, spreading the gospel globally. But this um, is just a little snippet um, of part of her life that she's written about in Tramp for the Lord. It was in a church in Munich that I saw him, a balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed out land, and I gave them my favorite mental picture. Maybe it's because the sea never is far from a Hollander's mind. But I always like to think that that's where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God casts those sins into the deepest ocean forever. And even though I can't find it in scripture, I always added, and I believe God then goes and places a sign out there that says, no fishing allowed. The solemn faces stared back at me not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence. In silence, they collected their wraps. And in silence, they left the room. And that's when I saw him working his way forward against the others. One moment, I saw the overcoat and the brown hat. The next, a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking past this man naked. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp, beneath the parchment of her skin. Oh, dear Betsy, how thin you were. The place was, was Ravensbrook, and the man who was making his way forward had been a guard, one of the most cruel guards. Now he was in front of me. Hand thrust out, a fine message, Fräulein. How good it is to know, as you say, that all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among the thousands and thousands of women? 
But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Raven's book, Brook, in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fräulein, again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there, eyes whose, I, whose sins had again and again been forgiven and would have to be forgiven. And I could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible, painful death simply for asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But to me, it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing that I ever had to do. If I had to do it, I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition. We forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, Neither will the Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had a home in, Ho in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. And those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able to return to the outside world and begin to, they began to rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars were. But those who nursed their bitterness, they remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. But you supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one that was stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, and it raced down my arm, and it sprang into our joined hands. And then this feeling, this healing warmth, seemed to be flooding my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. And I looked at him, and I said, I forgive you, brother. I cried with all, I forgive you with all of my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. But even so, I realized it was not my love that I was feeling. I had tried, but I did not have the power. It was the power of the Holy Spirit, as recorded in Romans 5.5. 5. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. Forgiveness brings healing, not only to the offender, but to the one offended. It heals relationships, and it destroys the works of the devil. Using the master key of forgiveness is an ongoing activity in our walk with God and in our operation in the kingdom of God. We continue to need to ask forgiveness, uh, to need to ask for forgiveness and receive forgiveness. And it is required that we continue to forgive as Jesus forgives. 
day by day. This is a day by day position. It is part of overcoming and destroying, really destroying sin in the world, destroying the works of the devil. Every day the devil will try to bring hurt or offense to you. And every day we have the privilege and the assignment from God to forgive as we have been forgiven. And I don't know about you, but I have found that to be pretty much true. Just about every day you have an opportunity to be offended. <laughs> don't you think so? I mean, maybe not every day, but almost. <laughs> Even sometimes by my own thoughts I can be offended, you know? <laughs> But that's what forgiveness is for. It's to cleanse us. It's to set us back in right order. We live in a, an awful world right now. It's, it's, yes, it's filled with blessings of God, but it's marred by cruelty and pain and sorrow and grief and suffering. And we know it's out of order. And God, it, you know, as Jesus was praying to the Father, he said, Lord, I, uh, Father, I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but just don't let the world be in, in them. They have to be in the world because we're here to bring the good news of the gospel and to bring that good news of the love of God. But in the midst of it, there's plenty of opportunity to be offended or to get hurt. We get hurt because simply because we love Jesus. Um, the enemy will arrange it. But we can destroy those works of the devil if we become, if we use that master key and become very proficient at receiving the grace of God, that empowerment of God, to respond the way Jesus responds. Mark 11, 25 to 26 says, Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your sins. Whoops, your trespasses. <laughs> but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Hebrews 12, 12 through 15, gives us good instructions. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. This is a serious warning. When we don't forget, forgive, there are roots of bitterness that can grow in our lives, and it, those roots will poison everything in our life. They'll rob us of our health, they'll rob us of our peace, they'll rob us of relationships, They'll rob us of the blessings of God. It's a serious thing when we refuse to receive the power from God to forgive. That's a choice. That's a, that's a willful choice when we refuse. Again, we don't have the ability in ourselves to forgive, but we've got a God who will give us that ability if we are willing. And it is a day-by-day -day thing, and it's a journey. Matthew 12, 35 through 37 says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. That's sobering too. But it's also a gift, an insight that gives us um, some insight to know what's in our heart. Our words will reveal what's in our heart. It'll come out of our mouth. When we're talking about a person, 
that we don't like because they've offended us or they've hurt us. And sometimes they've really sinned against us. They've done something terrible. Sometimes it's a perceived offense, but at any rate, we are to forgive. And to the degree that we forgive, it, it just moves into another place and it becomes forgotten. So much so that when you try to drag it up sometimes, you can't even remember the details of the thing. I've had that happen in my life where God has so delivered me of some things that were done in my past that really, if I were to sit here and try to remember the details, I, they're all blurry to me. I don't remember them. And they're gone. They don't have that poison in them anymore to harm me because of the grace of God, because of the precious blood of Jesus applied. He breaks the power of canceled sin and he sets the prisoner free. And it's, it's a powerful thing to see what God will do for us and the freedom that he brings us if we will cooperate with him. And it's profound. Because think about it, you being able with God to destroy the works of the devil, how awesome is that? To be a partner with God in destroying the enemy's works and that which the enemy likes to wear around as a trophy. How awesome is it that he's invited us into that and given us the power to be a part of it with him? Our words will reveal what's in our heart. And we will know by the things that we say whether forgiveness has been given by us or even whether it's been received. The person that is always beating themselves up with condemnation has not yet received by faith the true forgiveness that God is offering them. There's, there's Mars that come, Mars on our, our soul that come when we sin against God. And we've all got those. We all have those things that we're really sad about, that we, we wish we had not done. We wish we hadn't part partaken of something or participated in something. When we think of it, we cringe. But that is forgiven. And it can be buried in the deepest sea. That is God's desire, that it would be so that we would receive that forgiveness by faith and it could be so cleansed from us that it doesn't pop up in our mind all the time. And should the devil bring it up, we can say it's buried and you can't go fishing there. I'm going to close um, by reading another section from Tramp for the Lord. Because as I speak about this being... Um, a day-by-day -day thing, it's an ongoing journey to learn how to forgive like Jesus, and he works with us. He knows our heart if we're willing to or if we're just like set in stones in kind of a real stubborn way, saying, I'm not going to forgive. I'm not going to. I don't care, God, what you're saying. I'm not going to forgive. That's a dangerous place, and that's when roots of bitterness can start. But if you cry out for God's help, He'll begin to come and move in our hearts and help us to move into forgiveness. Now I have to find the place in the book, and then I can go on. I wish I could say that after a long and fruitful life, traveling the world, I had learned to forgive all my enemies. I wish I could say that merciful and charitable thoughts just naturally flowed out from me and on to others. But they don't. If there's one thing I've learned since I passed my 80th birthday, it's that I can't store up good feelings and behavior, but I can only draw them fresh from God each day. Maybe I'm glad it's that way, because every time I go to him, he teaches me something else. I recall the time, and I was almost 70 when this happened, when some Christian friends whom I loved and trusted did something which really hurt me. You would have thought that having been able to forgive the guards at Ravensbrook, forgiving Christian friends would be child's play, but it wasn't. For weeks, 
I seethed inside. But at last, I asked God again to work his miracle in me, and again it happened. First, that cold-blooded decision, that choice of my will, and then the flood of joy and peace. I had forgiven my friends, and I was restored to my father. Well, then why was I suddenly awake in the middle of the night, rehashing the whole affair again and again? My friends, I thought, people I loved. If it had been strangers, I wouldn't have minded so much. I sat up and switched on the light. Oh, Father, I thought it was all forgiven. Please help me to do it. But the next night, I awoke. They had talked so sweetly, too. <laughs> Never a hint of what they were planning. Oh, Father, I cried in alarm. Help me. Then it was that another secret of forgiveness became evident. It's not enough to simply say, I forgive you. I must also begin to live it out. And in my case, that meant acting as though their sins, like mine, were buried in the depths of the sea. If God could remember them no more, and he said so in Hebrews 10, 17, he says, your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Well then, I shouldn't remember those sins anymore either. And the reason the thoughts kept coming back to me was that I kept turning their sin over and over again in my mind. And so I discovered another of God's principles. We can trust God not only for our emotions, but also for our thoughts. As I asked him to renew my mind, he took away those thoughts. But he still had more to teach me. However, even from this single episode, many years later, after I had passed my 80th birthday, an American friend came to visit me in Holland. And as we sat in my little apartment in Barn, he asked me about those people from long ago who had taken advantage of me. Oh, it was nothing, I said rather smugly. It's all forgiven. By you, yes, he said. But what about them? Have they accepted your forgiveness? Well, they say there's nothing to forgive. They deny it ever happened. No matter what they say, though, I can prove they were wrong. And I went eagerly to my desk. See, I have it here in black and white. I saved their letters, and I can show you where <gasps> Corey... My friend came over and slipped his arm through mine and gently closed the door. Drawer. Aren't you the one whose sins are at the bottom of the sea? Yet the sins of your friends are etched in black and white. For an astonishing moment, I could not find my voice. Lord Jesus, I whispered at last, who takes away all my sins, Forgive me for preserving all these years the evidence against others. Give me grace to burn all the blacks and whites as a sweet-smelling sacrifice to your glory. I did not go to sleep that night until I had gone through my desk and pulled out those letters, curling with age, and fed them all into the, my little coal-burning grate. And as the flames leaped and glowed, so did my heart. Forgive us our trespasses, Jesus taught us to pray, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And in the ashes of those letters, I was seeing yet another facet of his mercy. What more? He would teach me about forgiveness in the days ahead. I did not know, but tonight's was good news enough. And then she ends this little passage by such a powerful paragraph. She says, 
Forgiveness is the key which unlocks the door of resentment and the handcuffs of hatred. It breaks the chains of bitterness and the shackles of selfishness. The forgiveness of Jesus not only takes away our sins, but it makes them as if they never had been. That's the wonderful master key of forgiveness. It will destroy the works of the devil every last bit if we'll cooperate with God and believe him and trust him to do that. Father, I thank you. Such a great love. There's no one who's been more offended than you. And yet, you don't keep that offense. You offer forgiveness. And you're the one that it cost so much to forgive. We thank you so much tonight, Lord, that we've had a lot of freedom given to us because of the shed blood of Jesus. And we thank you for that, and we want to lay hold of everything you have for us. And so I pray tonight, Father, that if there's anything in us that has been kind of a, in a dark place and not brought into the light, that you'd bring it into the light. I pray that you'd even help us to hear words we speak so that we can know what really is tucked away maybe down deep inside that still is a little bit bitter so that we can be cleansed of that terrible work of, of the enemy that brings bitterness into our lives, disease, and every manner of evil. And I just thank you that all we have to do is come to you and willfully choose for you to impart, again, your forgiveness to us and then to deliver to us that power to forgive and the power to love with your love, a love that is miraculous beyond what we know. And then we enjoy that peace that passes all understanding. We love you and we thank you for your kindness. We thank you that you created us to be holy, without spot or blemish, free, filled with joy, not burdened down by terrible memories, or not holding an account of everything people have done wrong against us. Thank you, Lord, that we can truly have that slate wiped clean. And we ask tonight that you would do that work in each one of our hearts and lead us as we move forward through days and weeks and months that we would keep that slate clean and that we would enjoy more and more the understanding of how to lay hold of that power that you've put within us by the Holy Spirit to be just like Jesus. We love you and we thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>